Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to our webinar, Security Monitoring in the Cloud, How RightScale Does It. In today's webinar, we'll guide you through the framework we used to, to define our goals for security monitoring, and we'll also share practical insights on how to, do, how to successfully do security monitoring in a cloud environment. But before we get started, we'd like to ask you a few quick questions. So we'll go ahead and launch our first poll question. Take a moment, let us know where are you in the cloud adoption process? Are you just getting started? Do you have a little bit of cloud usage and it's starting to go mainstream across your organization? Maybe you have broad usage, but your processes need a little bit of work. Or perhaps you're cloud experts and you're just here to learn more. So please just select the one that is most applicable. We'll leave this open for a few more seconds. And we'll push out the results to the audience. Okay, interesting. So there's an interesting distribution of cloud experience here with most of you um, having broad usage. So that's cool. Next question. This one's an easy one. What is your role? So select the one that is best applicable. So application developer, system administrator, architect, team lead slash business manager, or IT management. We'll leave this open for a few more seconds, and thank you so much for your patience. So let's go ahead and close this poll and push out the results. And it's interesting to see that most of you are architects. Um, so I'd like you in this next question to go ahead and share with us um, what security functions you're responsible for. So this will give us a little bit more flavor on that previous question about your role. So select all that apply. Um, are you responsible for software security? Maybe you're uh, responsible for network and operations or compliance. Perhaps you have responsibilities that cross multiple functions too. So it's be interesting to see. And this really helps us tailor the content of the webinar and to help us understand maybe the places that we should go a little bit deeper and explore. So we'll push out the results now. And it looks like uh, you have broad experience and responsibilities across these categories with uh, most of you uh, focusing on network and operations. So interesting. Thank you. And the final question, then we'll move on with the webinar. Where in which environments have you implemented security monitoring? So have you implemented it in a cloud environment, uh, which would be pretty cool because that's what we're about to talk about today. Um, have you implemented security monitoring in traditional enterprise? Or perhaps you've done both cloud and traditional enterprise, or maybe you've done neither. And that's okay. So we'll leave this open for a few more seconds. And we'll push out the results. And it looks like a lot of you have done it across cloud and traditional enterprise. So that's really, that's really interesting. Um, and maybe you'll have an opportunity during this webinar to ask some questions to get a little bit more insights. So let's go, let's move forward with our webinar. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers today. I have with me Phil Cox, he's RightScale's Director of Security and Compliance. I also have Tony Spitaro, he's RightScale's Senior Security Engineer. So one of the really cool things about GoToWebinar is the question section. So make sure to take advantage of this one-on-one um, -on -one time, you can think of it as, that you have with Phil and Tony today and ask them your questions directly. So we have um, some people from our team, Spencer and James, standing by to answer all of your questions as they come in, but there will be some of those questions that are a little bit more applicable for the audience at large, and Phil and Tony will select those to answer live on the air. So make sure to ask your questions early and often. We will have a live Q&A section at the end as well. Um, I want to point out too that the hashtag for this webinar is pound right scale. So please join the webinar conversation with us on Twitter. And I'd also like to point out, um, we've experienced this in some webinars in the past, if you're having audio issues and you're on VoIP, make sure to shut down extra apps and that'll help free up CPU bandwidth and will help give you a better quality webinar. So with that, I will hand it off to Phil. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Let me make sure I got control here. Um, yep, there it is. All right. Um, so, yeah, through the, the, the surveys, so I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Phil Cox. I'm the Director of Security and Compliance. I've been at RightScale for a little over a year and a half. Before that, I spent a lot of years um, consulting in uh, traditional enterprises, uh, deploying 
I've deployed a, a number of kind of global security event monitoring systems. Uh, so had you know quite a quite a bit of experience in that, and just the whole compliance realm and, and monitoring in general. So and coming to right scale, having to take that kind of experience and, and move it into the cloud. So a little bit of the background and where I come from. Our agenda today, we're going to talk about the problem in general, uh, talk about some premises and assumptions, and really kind of the meat of the, the webinar will be the why, how, and what, how to actually do this. And you know, a lot of this, uh, since I'm driving this process in uh, what we do at right scale, are the things that I've found work and don't work. So some people may agree, disagree, but this is kind of the experience that I have. Um, if you have other experiences or uh, you know, other things that you can throw in uh, through questions, things like that, great. Uh, but this is what I've found to actually work and allow you to deploy these things and be successful at some level. So with that, where is the, you know, what's the problem? Uh, you know, most folks don't do security monitoring well in the first place. I noticed there was a lot of people who have done it in the enterprise. Uh, it's been my experience over the past you know, decade or so that most enterprise security monitoring things just don't work. People buy tools and they get frustrated and they just it's just not something people spend a lot of time, effort, and money to do. So that's one of the things is doing it well in the first place is hard. And then there's a kind of a confusion or a puzzlement about how do you actually do this in the cloud, right? What do you do when you don't own the hardware and the network and infrastructure as a service in particular? So how do we go about doing that? And then lastly, or the one I've seen a lot, is kind of vendor cloud washing and sales, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's, that's being perpetuated, that you hear things, oh, we've got this, you know, vendor says, I've got X solution for cloud. Come to find out it really doesn't work in a infrastructure as a service environment. It wasn't architected for that. It doesn't work right. So a number of things that kind of bring us to the point where we have problems and, and kind of some confusion about where we go from this. So to set the, I guess, to set the context, you know, it's always good to start with a definition. What do we mean? What do I mean when I talk about monitoring and security monitoring? And so to, for that context, Security monitoring is the ability to collect, analyze, and alert on security-related events. And in that sense, we're not talking about the response, we're not talking about the forensics, a number of other things, but it's the collection, analyzing, and alerting. When we talk about infrastructure as a service, typically the collect part are system logs, database logs, application, host-based network traffic, things like that. The analysis part typically is a tool, some type of tool. The space varies widely. There are things you can roll your own, things you can buy, depending on the cost, you know, what your budget is, those type of things. And one comment I would have on the analysis part is don't get too complicated, right? You'll give up. That's, this is kind of one of those tidbits. If you pull anything out of this webinar is start simple. Start with things that you know, and we'll go over that a little bit more, but don't be too complicated in the analysis part. Um, and then lastly, if you don't alert, right, if nothing tells you something's wrong, the first two steps are worthless. To collect and analyze, which I would argue a lot of enterprises do, they have a tool that collects data and analyzes it, but nothing is ever generated, they never take that time. So that's security monitoring when we look at it and what we are thinking about in our context. One more thing, or maybe it should be the heart of security monitoring, is the analysis. Right? It's in the center. It is that analysis part. And the question that you ask is, how do you classify something as interesting? How do you know? And the answer, uh, me being a good security guy, right, is it depends. It really does depend on your organization. If somebody comes to you and says, oh, this general, you know, signature, this general look is going to apply to your organization globally, they're lying to you, right? They're trying to sell you something. They're not providing a solution. The reality is, is these, these log analysis, what you do, what you look at, really needs to be tailored to your organization. That's why there's really not a one-size-fits-all. You know, there are some examples that 
probably maybe are generic um, or general. Interactive logins to the database server. You know, those are things I care about. Database access, access from unexpected systems. Um, another interesting one that I haven't seen a lot of people do. Um, you know, looking for logins from past staff. You know, does your offboarding process work correctly? How do you know? You know, and in kind of taking a real quick tangent here, in the vein of cloud ubiquitous access. You know, there's not that VPN that you shut off, right? That, oh, now we don't have access to the systems anymore. A lot of these things, the infrastructure, the service, depending on how they're configured, you've got access from everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And so identity and access management, those things become important. You can use security monitoring to, to help, uh, you know, supplement those controls. So with that, a uh, real quick starting premise on this. Cloud and thus infrastructure as a service is a new way to deliver IT. If you try to take what you did in the enterprise, right, with your gigabit bandwidth, with firewalls, with the fact that you could look at all the network traffic, you had spam ports, things like that, if you try to shoehorn that into an infrastructure as a service environment, you're going to fail. It's not a matter of if, but when you're going to get frustrated and you know, pitch the baby out with the bathwater. So it's a new way to deliver IT and think about security monitoring in that context. Um, second premise that I go after is there's nothing new under the sun in terms of security. Fundamentals are fundamentals. Uh, who has access, access control, role-based access control, uh, you know, what you want to look at, unauthorized logins, those type of things, very fundamental clouds everywhere else. There is no secret sauce. And lastly, monitoring an infrastructure as a service in particular, since that's our focus today, is really a subset of monitoring in a traditional enterprise. And when I mean a subset, the sources, back to that collect, analyze, and alert, those sources that you use to collect from will be a subset of what you had in your enterprise, because you had applications. The biggest difference is typically the visibility into that network. There is no such thing as a span port currently that you can get access to. And we'll talk about ways to facilitate that if you want to, but you're, you are probably going to be causing more problems than you're, than you're preventing. And so with that, kind of jump into you know, what matters. Right? Now for the fun part. The first thing you have to start with, and I, I, I love the movie iRobot, uh, Will Smith, he's talking, you know, Dr. Spooner jumped out the window, and he's got a holographic image there, and he's like, says, why would you kill her yourself? And Dr. You know, Lanning says, that detective is the right question. And so when we start with this, we don't start with technology, we start with asking the question, why? Why are we doing security monitoring? Not how, not what, but why? If you don't start with that, you'll fail. And again, I, the reason I say fail, what I, and what I equate as failure, is implementing a solution that doesn't meet your needs and you basically let it decay. It just sits there, you pay for it, and you never use it again. And that's failure to me in terms of monitoring. So start with why. For us, as an example, our why was easy, right? Again, I've done this for a lot of years. I knew what we needed in, within right scale. And we basically came down to three why we were going to do this. Why were we going to spend any money, any effort? Number one was to meet compliance requirements of our SSA 16 and PCI. So I knew why that was. Second is we wanted to have a way to implement burglar alarms. Something, a mechanism by which we could alert on things that we knew were not supposed to happen. And thirdly, we wanted to be able to do forensics. If a customer came to us or if we had suspected something, we wanted to be able to go back and have the information there so we could do adequate forensics. That was our why. Wasn't any more, wasn't any less. There are, you know, again, through my experience, there are other things that people may have as why. For example, uh, in, again, in my history, some people wanted to identify taking data off of removable drives. That's why they wanted monitoring. We want to see identify excessive file transfers, abnormal print activity, 
um, abnormal user activity, identify anomalous traffic. And with that one, just as a, again, kind of a quick tangent or caveat, is that anomalous network traffic can be used for operational help as well. You see something, you I remember you know, broadcast storms, those type of things that your event monitor may pick up. They may, it may see it as a denial of service, but it may be just a, you know, a system that's went haywire. So it can be, can be helpful in operational as well. Um, yours will be different and the same as others. Some of these may apply to you, some of them may not. But you have to ask the question, you know, why? Once you've asked why, now you need to take to consider, you need to move kind of to the next step, which is how. And when I say how, it's how do we want to implement our whys? Within the guise of infrastructure as a service, you know, are we going to want to use a host-based intrusion detection because we need to look at what's on the host? You know, how are we going to do this? Do we want application information, system information, network traffic? Um, is there, you know, do we need to create that network choke point so we can get that span port capability that we had? Are there performance requirements? So these are all considerations that you say, all right, I know why I want to do this. Now how am I going to get it done? I've got this infrastructure as a service, the way it sits. What am I going to need to do? What are my components going to look like as I'm architecting this? So Phil, I have an excellent and topical question from the audience regarding how. Uh, somebody wants to know specifically if my why includes uh, managing access to my various cloud portals, how do I manage the accounting and logging of administrative changes uh, to the cloud portals that my users have access to? Ah, so a very, a very good and interesting question. So how do you consume those? So you've got a, basically a software as a service. You've got a management portal out there and you want to be able to consume those. So I would say what you do is you, you find out what that cloud provider gives you in terms of a way to consume those logs. Uh, the problem currently is very few software as a service companies or platform as a service for all that matter actually provide you detailed log information that you could consume into your event monitoring solution and, and thus alert on, right? That you'll collect, analyze. There's, there's no visibility in the collection. Um, I will say, to tout our own horn at, at right scale, that that's one of the good things that, that we provide, is that we have a mechanism by which you can consume the, you know, someone logs in, somebody changes a role, someone changes access, someone's granted a role. Those type of security events can be consumed via an API or another mechanism to pull that into your event monitoring solution. So, the short answer to the question is you have to consume what your SaaS provider gives you. Um, currently, there are very few SaaS providers that give you anything. So it's really kind of custom at the time. But it is, you know, it's a great point and probably the biggest thing that we deal with because part of my job at RightScale as well is the corporate security. And we consume almost 100 different SaaS applications, and that's why I know not many of them actually provide that. And that's something that we're pushing as customers, and I would encourage everyone else, go to your SaaS providers and say, we want visibility into our logs. Give us a standard way to get, get that information and pull it into our event monitoring. But right now, it uh, doesn't exist much. So uh, with that, how, back to kind of our how. Um, we think about how are we going to do this, you know, what were the things that we cared about at right scale. Um, when we looked at it, alert latency was one of the things that we cared about, bandwidth and data transfer costs because we generate hundreds of gigabytes a day of log data. If you don't think about the cost of that, that thing can get prohibitively expensive. Reliability of log stream and then one of the other considerations is how do we want this deployed? What do we want the model to look like? The local agent, central alerting, local alerting, you know, agent list. How, how do we kind of look at this thing? So from there, the details of what we looked at 
and, and we said, all right, how? We want an alert fired within three minutes. If we get something that happens, I want, I want to know within three minutes for a burglar alarm. The bandwidth, we said, hey, what we're going to do, because of the infrastructure as a service, we're going to deploy the, the architecture in such a way that those components are in zones and regions that have either free, ideally, or very low cost for high bandwidth consumption. Reliability, we wanted to make sure that that central log store that we had, we decided on the central log store that we had, was a reliable transport. And then the, the deployment models, we looked at it and said, you know what, really, we're going to use all of these. Um, there's not just one that we're going to stick with, but all of them look, look pretty good and are going to be parts of, parts of what we want. Um, with that, I'm going to actually pass the ball to Tony uh, to talk a little bit about something that's, that's out of the scope of kind of the InfoSec security monitoring and gets, uh, gets into to some of the application things where you'll, you should grasp after Tony's talk that, that we kind of have a, a wide kind of a corporate uh, security monitoring mindset and we do it in different ways in different parts. So with that, Tony, I'm going to hand you the ball. Thank you, Phil. So as we learned earlier during our, our, uh, our polls, uh, many of us are architects and um, as architects, you know, we're probably deploying several different kinds of workload in the cloud. Media transcoding, batch analytics, online transaction processing, which is a fancy way of saying anything that interacts with a relational database. So any of those workloads can be an application. It doesn't need to be a web application. I define an application as something that interacts with an end user, also known as someone whom you don't trust implicitly and completely. When you're deploying an application, it sounds a little bit scary, but it's actually a good thing because applications perform their own access control. They're aware of how users are interacting with them. And that means that there are numerous alerting opportunities when your app is doing the three A's of authentication, authorization, and audit. In other words, when your app does access control, this creates interesting moments for you to emit monitoring data. So something as humble as a failed lock-in, a logout, uh, sorry, failed login, or a lockout if somebody's been trying to log in too much, a new user being created, a role being granted or revoked, um, they don't necessarily tell us something singly, but if you consider them as a sequence of, of events with origin IP and user inf user agent information attached, you know we can we can spot a bad guy knocking on the front door. And if he knocks hard enough, that's probably reason to generate an alarm. Not something that we would necessarily see from the network perspective or the system perspective. Uh, likewise, authorization events. If somebody fails an access check, if uh, a lot of people unexpectedly gain or lose privileges at once, that's a natural monitoring hook. And we can alert based on the expected frequency of these things. If they deviate more than a certain amount from the mean, for example, alarm. Um, you know, it, it depends on your level of tolerance for noise. You can go much, much deeper if you want to. Uh, for instance, starting in two weeks, every time our web application gets a request that looks like it might be cross-site request forgery, I'm going to receive an email to my personal inbox. In this case, I'm, a labeling, I'm enabling this alert not really as a burglar alarm, but as a debugging tool. We're making improvements to our web UI at the moment and I want to make sure we haven't forgotten about some neglected form tag in a dark corner that's going to become unusable because of our CRF, CSRF protection. But depending on how the next few months go and how full my email inbox gets, I might decide to leave this one enabled because it's just another sign that somebody might be knocking at our front door. So information security is a very broad term. It encompasses many disciplines. Phil is giving us an excellent system and network-centric view of security monitoring, which to be honest is where most of the action is, it's where most of the products and solutions are. But at heart, I'm a software guy and I see the world in terms of software and software security. So um, I know a lot of you out there are architects, but uh, for those who don't see the world in terms of software, um, consider this a plea from, from the software guys of the world. Don't forget the tremendous potential of your applications to generate their own monitoring data. Work with your developers to figure out where to install those hooks and where to feed the data. And with that, back to you, Phil. Thanks, Tony. 
Uh, so one of the things that hopefully I'm sitting here listening to Tony, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, is that you should a concept you should get that I hope is kind of conveyed, and I'll say it is that at right scale we look at security monitoring kind of in a in a me mechanism or a method of different spots total coverage. The fact is is that I'm not. I know Tony's got my monitoring back you know, in the application. I can pull things from logs. I can do things like that. But instead of thinking as the traditional people think, oh, that's security monitoring, that's InfoSec's job, or that's somebody else's job, we've got a mindset you know, that the monitoring and security is my problem. It's not a their problem. So software architects looking at that, Tony, as he's thinking about it, doing those type of things. And I think that's that that concept is key in cloud, in infrastructure as a service and cloud in general, that similar to the DevOps, similar to, it's really people understanding that the, the shared responsibility of a lot of these things. So great points, Tony, um, just uh, terrific from that standpoint. So jumping back on the track, we've talked about the why and the how. So, why are we doing this? Figuring out what is the business purpose? Why are we doing what we're doing? How are we going to do this in a sense? What's the architecture we want to use? What are the characteristics? What are the requirements that we're going to have? And lastly, once you've done that, then you have to define, somehow you have to actually implement this, right? Pontification is great, but at some point you've got to get down and actually do something. So this is the what. Um, you know, do you pick a vendor product? Do you use an open source? Do you, you know, internally develop it? I remember writing when I was at Lawrence Livermore in the early 90s, writing a an article for Usenix about using TCP dump to do network intrusion detection. Um, I would not recommend that. It was a it was a great uh, you know effort or exercise you know in academics, but at the time it, nothing else was there but you know, internally developed. And really, part of that what is also identifying your limitations. Uh, one of the biggest ones, cost. What can you afford? Uh, there may be some great tools out there, but if they're $500,000 and you've got a $5,000 budget, it's not practical. Um, platform support. What, what platform are you trying to support? Is, it, you know, is there support for that? Product support. If the thing breaks, where do you go to get some help and get it fixed? And lastly, and overlooked a lot, but, but is very important, is, is there enough education? Can you go get training on actually how to use the product? If you can't use it, then it's worthless. So deciding on the what has a lot of, you know, has a lot of kind of ins and outs for figuring out you know, what you want to do. And again, your mileage may vary. Where you sit, we had some certain you know, certain things that we picked. Our what? I'm going to kind of bounce through this real quick and then go into it in a little bit more of a you know deep dive. Is OSEC uh, Trend Micro's free? And I use nobody can see me, but I use my you know quote free because it takes effort and you know time to actually do this. Uh, our syslog, uh, RELP, the reliable. Uh, event log protocol. Uh, we went with a commercial uh, product, Cloud Passage, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then a uh, centralized log collector using uh, basically RELP to that collector and then dumping to our, our, our OSEC alerting server. So a little bit more of the details on this. Two, two ways we ended up using, so OSEC is a tool, again, developed by Trend Micro. I know a lot of people use it. I know Bill Burns at Netflix, they're you know, big proponents of this. Uh, it's not a trivial, it's a trivial product to set up and just get running, but if you're going to use it, it's, it's non-trivial because you actually have to write rules and, you know, and do some things with it. Uh, you can, for us, we wanted a general global OSEC, and the way we ended up doing it was just having our instances when they launch use RELP, dump to a central syslog server, and then the syslog server stream to our OSEC server for alerting. That gave us the reliable logs from every instance that comes up and comes down. And I guess I should talk about that. In infrastructure as a service, 
right? It's the elasticity of the cloud that we really care about. I not care about, but is one of the huge benefits. Well, that means systems are up and down. If you have to register, deregister, this one's there, add it, unadd it, and some tools were good, some tools weren't weren't good at that. For us, we use right scale. Right scale when the system comes up, set it up to send the syslogs to that central syslog server in the same kind of zone or region that they're in, and then those syslog collectors live stream it to a a, a local OSEC server where we do the alerting. Uh, we manage the InfoSec manages the alerts and rules files for OSEC via GitHub. So we have a source code control management that gets deployed when the systems are launched. They pull the latest rule sets down. It allows us to be able to test in our you know test environment, you know, those type of things. So works out great. We can do some general generalized alerting on that. Um, there are things that we know because it's in our platform. Those burglar alarms that these things shouldn't happen. Uh, and just as a caveat, writing those custom rules and knowing your environment is key. And then, lastly, we're able because we use GitHub, we're able to test these rules in staging. Um, it's one of the nice things about cloud. We have separate production dev test. We can run those and see what the noise to you know signal to noise ratio is going to be. Tune those out before we deploy them in production. Phil, we have so, another great question from the audience. Um, somebody had wondered, can any of the speakers name some open, uh, some popular open source tools uh, regarding the what of security monitoring? And I thought I would point out that the OS in OSSEC stands for open source. Uh, OSSEC is an open source product. Um, that means it's free as in freedom. You know, there's still a cost to adopt it, still a cost to tune your rule set. But you know, when you buy into something like OSSEC, you're joining a community of people who have the same goals. Um, and that can prove a benefit. Uh, Phil mentioned RELP, and he'll get to that in a, a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Uh, but I wanted to point out that the uh, logging product we use, our syslogv, is also open source. Uh, good points, Tony. And I'm sure that there are others out there. There are, you know, again, kind of free versions, not really open source, but there are free versions of commercial tools and lots of things that are potentially potentially out there, but you know, you're going to have to have to look at it. This worked, you know, worked for us. Another little bit about OSEC is that for some burglar alarms, for some things that we wanted to do, we wanted to have local alerting on the boxes themselves, as opposed to everything go to the central server and have the central alert, and doing like some file integrity monitoring, some other different things actually on the box. And OSEC provided the ability for us to do that as well. And this was one of kind of related to our. SSA 16 controls and some things that we wanted to do on what we deemed critical systems. Like, hey, this is a critical system. We're going to be able to, to do something a little different um, in that respect. Uh, pulled down the same rules. We use Git, again, GitHub for source code control to manage that. It works great uh, in that environment because it's there, uh, you know, provides us that auditability. And there, you know, for the most part, be able to test it as well. So OSEC was a tool, obviously, that we found that worked for our environment. Uh, I had mentioned that the one of the other what's that we picked was Cloud Passage. Um, Cloud Passage gave us the alerting that we needed, but it also gave us benefits for our PCI compliance. Uh, our cardholder data environment is is much, much smaller than our platform itself. I'd argue that the RightScale platform is probably one of the most complex cloud applications on the planet. Um, there may be some others that rival its size and complexity, but I'm, I've yet to see it. Um, so from that standpoint, our cloud and our, you know, our PCI environment is much, much smaller than that. Utilizing Cloud Passage gave us some benefits of separation of duties, it does some configuration reviews, which, which help with the PCI compliance. Uh, did some malicious process watching. Ha can do some host-based firewall management, because in a sense, depending, let's say you're running in Amazon and you're using general security groups, there are only ingress, where PCI requires ingress and egress filtering. So you can do some things uh, like that. And in reality, for us, again, this gets back to 
why do you do this, what type of education do you, um, you know, knowledge, those type of things. The fact is, is that when the term cloud passage is used with PCI auditors, they have a comfortability level with it. They, they are confident in the, in the product itself, so that, you know, that bought us some things that, you know, that, that we liked. Uh, and I speak from past history because I was a QSA for five years, so I understand that sometimes giving people a warm fuzzy because they have a confidence in a product is 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 worth it. Um, real quick, back back to on OSEC that I, I should have mentioned is that they have this agent model that can that they can run, and what we're looking at in this whole thing, be it Cloud Passage or OSEC or you know RELP, R Syslog, those type of things. This whole monitoring thing is always a an ongoing project, a work in progress. We're going to look at tools, we're going to evaluate and make sure things are working the way we want them to. And I think that's important to understand that it, it's not like, oh, we're done. You know, we got it, this is implemented, I'm going to move on. It's part of having a project, having a kind of a program. This is part of our security program. Uh, and, and looking at that and kind of the work in progress is there. On that uh, note, real so, quick. Uh, if I can break in quickly, yep. um, somebody had asked, uh, when you say we at RightScale, um, you're talking about the RightScale system using that technique, so in this case using OSSEC to monitor, uh, and they wanted to clarify that you know there is no OSSEC or other security monitoring uh, available to RightScale managed instances being run by our users. Uh, so I thought I'd jump in and clarify that that's correct. What we're talking about here is how RightScale has implemented OSSEC and other technologies uh, for the purpose of securing our platform. Um, you know, in, in the vein of throwing you a bone, and, and I'm not making any, any commitments here, that's, that's not my role, but I will say that, you know, we've run right scale on right scale, and so the expertise we've gained deploying OSEC and these other technologies through right scale could eventually make its way into our server template library. Uh, that's an observation of a could, not a will, please understand. <laughs> yeah, so actually, uh, there are OSEC uh, server templates in the library that are published. So any any customer that want that any right scale customer that wants to use OSEC can go grab the server template and use it today. Um, so there are again, as Tony said, free as in freedom. Right? Nothing nothing is that simple. But my experience, and I'd be more than happy to you know to chat with anybody offline. That, you know, contact information, tell you what we've done and how we've done it. Um, it's there. And yes, to address that question specifically, everything we're talking about is how we do it. The, the reality is, is that we've got a SaaS-based platform that we have to secure. This isn't trying to sell our customers anything. This is how Phil Cox, as the Director of Security and Compliance at RightSkill, goes about meeting our security needs for our SaaS-based platform. And so, uh, real quick, because uh, I know we're going to, actually I think we're doing okay on time. Uh, RELP. We talked about RELP as something reliable, usually a little bit of extra disk. Where syslog, you throw a UDP packet on the, you know, on the wire. If it doesn't get there, ah, who cares, right? We don't buffer it. We don't do anything. Where for RELP, it's buffered to extra disk and memory. So you got to think about that in terms of your instances you're launching, as well as stateful. So you're going to have some bandwidth, right? Instead of just a UDP packet on the net, right? You've got at least a three-way handshake and you know some data that goes. A uh, couple of gotchas that we ran into with RELP and you got to think about it. It's not compatible with TLS right now or SSL. So in the instances where or the situations where we would be passing this traffic across an untrusted network, right? We had to basically use S tunnel to keep that secure so people couldn't sniff it on private networks. Uh, what we consider the private IP space of the, you know, the cloud provider that we use or within our private network, it, you know, that was fine. Uh, our syslog versions, right, that we use, when you deploy something, it's likely that the part of the distribution you use that our syslog is old. So you need to think about how do you do that. You have to tune, right, memory queues to avoid performance. You know, you got a 10 meg log, our syslog debuffering. You get a network hiccup, and you didn't plan for it. Right? You got a, you got maybe a problem. Um, I know our ops team had done quite a bit of testing to, you know, tune this thing and get it working well. 
And then some of the other things is that there was some buggy support for things that didn't natively support syslog. So just understand that RELP, it wasn't just a plug and play. Again, free is in freedom. You have to do some planning, you have to do some testing, you have to figure out how it works in your environment. Phil, there, and then, uh, oh, yeah. regarding the what's, we did have another question. Uh, circling back to Cloud Passage, since this is a good time to be discussing our what's, uh, somebody had, well, I have two related questions. Somebody had wondering, uh, been wondering, security monitoring as a service, what's your view of this in terms of market and customer perspective? Uh, and somebody else had, had a more specific question. Who has the best virtual network security platform? And, do you see cloud-based network security as a key differentiator for customers buying security solutions? So I have my take on these pair of questions, but I, I thought I would give you a chance uh, to, to air your opinion first, um, since we obviously use Cloud Passage and therefore we see some value in, in this concept of monitoring as a service. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you answer the second one because I, I wouldn't. Uh, so when we think about Software, you know, security as a service, cloud passes, those type of things. I think that that really, it dep again, depends on your organization. If you don't have the staff to do it right and you've got the money, I think using a, a vendor to provide the service is is excellent, awesome, it's great. Um, it, 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 there, I have no problem in it. You know, depending on where I'm at. If I had all sorts of money and no people, I would, you know, assume a logic, uh, you know, Splunk, Cloud Passage. Those companies do what they do very well, and I have no problem using them. On the other hand, if I have people and not the money that it would need to be able to do these things right, I may look more at an, an OSEC or something like that. So. To answer the question, security as a service, I'm a big proponent of. I think you should consume them. If you, you know, if it's not your area of expertise, and if it's not something that you can do right with you know, with other tools, um, or and if you if you want to do it yourself, the nice part about doing it yourself or using the other tools is that you get the ability to be custom to yourself when you use the vendor, it may not, you know, there, there's some level of generality, you know, that, that people have. So with that strong proponent, I think it's a great thing, really dependent upon kind of your resources and the organization. If you're a smaller company, I'd use them. Fantastic. I think those type of things are great. Thank you. For Go ahead. So, so, you know, delving down into a little bit more detail um, to answer the question of who has the best virtual network security platform. Um, you know, I would say that, that cloud technologies, well, technologies in general, they're, they're like styles of pizza. Um, there's no best fit, whether you prefer deep dish or thin crust. It's a matter of your taste, the business requirements, your budget, and, and maybe other factors. Uh, what I will say with specifically with virtual networking is that in the past two years, most cloud vendors, public and private, have been stepping up their network security game. We've seen them add egress filtering interconnect to your own data center or to other data centers, multiple network interfaces per instance, each with its own policy. Um, so, you know, how do you relate that to security as a service? I would say that you can't bolt on security. That is a universal truth. And what that means is that when you choose a cloud provider, focus on the network security capabilities they already provide. Uh, find something that works for your uh, use case, for your deployment. You can add a security monitoring solution, but it, it generally can't do things that your platform can't already do. One notable exception, looping back to Cloud Passage, uh, is that you know, Cloud Passage can manage IP tables rules on your Linux instances in real time as your network topology changes and as instances join and leave your, your trust domain. Uh, so this is a great example of being able to use security as a service uh, to make up for gaps in a cloud vendor that may be, might be otherwise a perfect fit, but might lack uh, firewall functionality. So, so I guess uh, to summarize, there's no best, and sometimes the best is actually a composition of technologies and solutions that you cobble together. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, uh, um, couldn't have said it better myself. Although, although I will say that I think you're wrong. I think thin crust 
<laughs> white sauce pizza is is actually the best, but you know, we can argue that. Well, so, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of coming towards the end of things. So, a little bit about our SSA 16 control process, right? Because I've mentioned that some of our whys and some of the things we chose were based upon that. And some people may be saying, well, well how'd you do this? Well, in reality, we worked with the auditors, uh, identified certain actions and things that, that they saw. And this is a complete tangent and just a kind of word, word to the wise or you know, for someone who has been through this SSA 16 process with auditors for a purely SaaS based platform and we are we are cloud is that the auditors are learning they do not understand this technology real well so working with your auditors and coming up with these things that give them a comfortability level about the controls because they understand what needs to be done from a business standpoint and being able to to talk to them and work through these things was important so we identified certain actions and events that were there. We identified systems that these things needed to be on and functionality of that. And then we wrote uh, custom OSEC rules or alerts to be able to alert on those things that, that we agreed upon. So that's how we used OSEC to be able to go in and identify and meet SSA 16 controls. And again, you probably could have done the same thing with like a Sumo Logic or a Splunk, um, you know, at that level, for us, OSEC was just something we, you know, we had chosen. And uh, just kind of a last on the a semi deep dive, right? This is probably more like a, you know, more like a three foot pool instead of an eight foot pool. Uh, and any details, again, people can contact me. I'd be more than happy to, you know, share. Is our burglar alarms? Um, what we had decided is that our databases hold all the important data, right? Imagine that. Um, we had that, we, we identified databases and systems that directly connect to those databases. And we decided to do local alerting on those because I didn't want some type of network hiccup or anything to, to cause a problem. Um, some examples of the alerts that, that we look at, this is not exhaustive because I don't want to make, you know, trying to break into these things for any bad guy that may be listening, you know, too easy. but Successful interactive login. Try to SSH into my box every day. Literally thousands. I don't care about those. What I do care about is when somebody successfully logs in. Right? I want to know that. On those critical systems, that database server, I want to know it and I want to know it now because it doesn't happen all that much. The integrity of certain files on that database server were very important to me. Permissions, those type of things. Failed login to the database itself. Because most of what we look at in our production environment, not most, I mean 99.9% .9 of everything that happens is all programmatic. It's applications accessing the database. There should never be a failed login at the database level. You know, the you know, MySQL, a connect to a database, an authentication should never fail. I want to know immediately when that happens because one of two things is, it means one of two things. An application's broke, you need to fix that, or somebody's trying to break in and they've got past firewalls and other things that I shouldn't see. So those are, that one in particular is something that I'm really, really um, concerned about. And then one that I haven't done, you know, throw up here I'd like to is failed drops. Somebody goes in to drop a table, and if somebody figures out a way to try to SQL, does a drop, something there through the application, I'd like to know about that. Because that's back to, and maybe I'll ping Tony and say, hey, can your application start looking for this? How hard would that be from the signal to noise ratio? Those type of things. And again, you get back to, why am I doing this? Why do I want to do this? You know, how do I go about it? And then figuring out you know, what's there. So the other thing too, just really challenge uh, from the audience. Um, let's say you were using a hosted database service like RDS. How would you implement burglar alarms if you find yourself in that situation? Well, looks like we might be having some momentary audio issues with Phil. 
Oh, okay. The, the, the question was, uh, how do you use burglar alarms on a database service like RDS? Hmm. Okay, looks like we might be having some technical difficulties with our audio. All right, well, um, I suppose I'll give this a stab myself <laughs> until we can get Phil back on the line here. Um, you know, the, the answer to that would be you're never going to be um, as good with the level of detail you can extract from a hosted database service. Um, you know, RDS does not export any sort of, of logging or monitoring data that I'm aware of. I may be wrong. I'm not a, a specialist in RDS. So, you know, what I would do to compensate is I would intercept database activity at the application layer and, and augment it with what monitoring I could. Obviously, something like a failed database login I couldn't spot, but at least I could look into the queries, the inserts, updates, and deletes. Uh, so I understand that Phil is back. Uh, I believe so. Can what? you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So I heard a little bit what you were saying, and I, my answer was, is you can't. Um, in the sense of what we're talking about, it gets back to the point of, you know, you've got a SaaS, a PaaS provider, what do they expose to you? And those type of things, to my knowledge, aren't exposed via RDS. Um, it's hard enough to expose it on a MySQL server that you're, you know, you're running yourself. So getting back to if you have a requirement, if that's something you want to do, then you know, you may not be able to use RDS or SimpleDB or something else, um, if, if that makes sense. Fantastic. So, um, real quick, I'm just, uh, let me hit the bottom of this thing, because I, I don't want this to be lost. The last bullet on this slide was that there were a, a number of default OSEC alerts that were just, you know, there, the signal to noise ratio was so low that it drove you nuts. And so we, I ignore these. You know, some people may not. We chose, I look in my environment and say, these things, I don't care. Again, I don't care if there's a failed SSH login because people are out there scanning us all the time. We have controls in place to make sure that doesn't happen. So I don't need the alert. Though that list may be something you would use if you were using OSEC, it may not. Again, so your mileage may your mileage may vary in in that respect. And then, so lastly, and kind of in conclusion, and then I think there are other questions and things we could probably uh, talk about. Is it's important to start with why? You've got to start there. If you don't, it's not going to you know it's not going to happen. It, you're going to be you're not going to be successful. Uh, the ease of administration, especially in a highly elastic infrastructure as a service environment, is very important. Kudos, you know, a, you know obviously a plug for right scale in order to do that. Right? We manage tons of hosts with complex deployments, and right scale is just a tool that makes that so much easier. And then lastly, and I can't stress this enough, start with things you know are problems. Limit the false positives. Don't start a default everything turned on and then try to ratchet it down. Turn everything off and start with things, oh, I know this is bad, and put them in and, and walk it up. You're going to be so much more successful. Now you have to commit to you know, maintaining it and keeping the rules and having it as a program, because if you turn everything off and just start it and say, oh, I'm not getting any alerts, you know, it's as worthless as turning it on and getting a ton of alerts and not, not listening to it. So real important, start with why, think about how we administer these things, especially infrastructure as a service, and start with things you know. Burglar alarms to me were, you know, were important. Uh, with that said, again, everything's a work in progress. We may, you know, a year from now, maybe we'll be using something different. We might go to a completely, you know, service-based solution like a Sumo Logic, Splunk, Cloud Passage. We may be with OSEC. Uh, just don't, you know, don't put your feet in concrete 
with a technology, but continue, can't be changing every day, don't change with the wind, but be willing to, you know, to kind of evaluate and make sure when the why changes, walk through the process again. So with that, um, I think we've probably got some few minutes for some questions. We do. We actually have a steady stream of hows <laughs> that have been uh, coming into us. So what I'll do is just kind of go down this list in, in prioritized order and you know see how many we can fit in. Uh, I believe that both Phil and I are available for a few minutes past the hour in case we, we have uh, even more questions. Um, so a very, very interesting one um, is how do you monitor security of cloud IT products that have current known vulnerabilities reported to the National Vulnerability? In other words, what happens when we get one of those disclosure alerts? So what happens within right scale when we do that? So, uh, for example, we're, everybody probably knows this if they've ever read any of my blogs, we're a Rails shop, right? So we keep an idea of the, the last problems that, that Rails had. You know, January was not a good month for Ruby and Rails, right? We get those alerts either off the Ruby uh, Ruby site, we get those, and then it's escalated through our our escalation process. If we see it, you know, we evaluate it. Tony's Tony's obviously in on all of those, and if it's something that we need to get deployed in, you know, ten minutes, we need to get it deployed now. Then goes through our dev escalation, and it'll get it'll get deployed. Goes through the the process of you know testing the the patch, figuring it out, and getting it deployed out. Again, back to that, the ability to manage large and complex instances and having a tool to do that, RightScale provides that for us. So you got to keep an ear on it. Um, one of the things too, I'll throw it out there, for things that aren't you know, immediate, then what we do is it goes into our, we're an agile shop, so it goes into our backlog and it will be part of the patch process. We do, you know, we do testing, vulnerability testing, actually application-based testing as a company. Uh, we do it on our, on our instances and our application on a regular basis and have that process. So really, it's about keeping your, you know, your ears to the ground and when something comes up, know in your environment, evaluate whether it's important enough, and if it is, fix it. To add a little bit of right flavor to there. deploy it. <laughs> Uh, to use to 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 add a little bit of flavor there, just considering last month's vulnerabilities, which you know we had to jump on, um, you really have, you know, you have two primary responsibilities as somebody who's responding to a disclosure incident like this. Uh, you need to mitigate the risk, and that means either patching up your software, or if you can't do that, finding a compensating control. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the second thing is is cleanup, right? You put you press the deploy button, which in right scale means your fix, whatever it is, gets deployed to maybe thousands of instances simultaneously. Um, that's the relatively easy part. Uh, then you need to do a bit of forensics, um, and it, this depends on you know how severe the vuln is, how how susceptible you think you may be. But some diligence is always in order because there will always have been a gap between disclosure and your response. Um, so what it boils down to is being quick and being diligent and getting creative when it turns out that you can't upgrade to that shiny latest patched version of whatever the software product is. So we had another question. Uh, actually, we, we covered this in, in the uh, webinar material, but uh, somebody had asked, do you use OSSEC for file system integrity monitoring? And I believe the answer there, Phil, is yes. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We use it for for our, what we deem our critical systems. Um, so yeah, we, we use that, that functionality for certain files and stuff that we, that we deem critical. Uh, I will say I don't use the default uh, file integrity monitoring you know, path specifications that are there uh, simply because, again, the way our platform works, it actually maintains certain files. If a system decides to try to overwrite something, it will actually restore it. And so you end up getting a lot of hash collisions, so we just turn that off, and there are specific files that we look at. But the answer to that is yes, we do use file integrity monitoring Good on know. critical systems. Um, and, you know, broadening the scope a bit, somebody had wondered, uh, what is your opinion about the CSA, the Cloud Security Alliance, 
and their approach to um, well to security in the cloud, specifically the cloud control matrix, the idea of cloud audit, and so forth. Yeah, so I'm <clears throat> I am a I am a big proponent um, of the Cloud Security Alliance of the cloud control matrix. I think it's great because it does map you know controls to things that like you know the FISMA to PCI to HIPAA, so it helps kind of provide a, a centralized, this type of control applies to these things, so I think it's a great mapping tool. I am I am a huge proponent of the, I guess, I guess the purpose of cloud audit. I would wish that, that everyone would, that it would become a standard, because it's a way to get that visibility into systems. Um, we're working on trying to, to implement that. So while I'm a big proponent of both the CSA, the cloud control matrix, the cloud audit uh, initiatives, the reality is, is that until customers start kind of banging on cloud providers and saying, we want this, nay, we require this, we want you to do this, we need this, um, I'm not sure it's going to get a lot of traction. And then you know, the reality is, is that what do you spend your time on? If customers aren't asking for it, it's really hard to, you know, it's really hard to justify, you know, taking the effort to do that when, you know, when there's, when arguably there's no revenue behind it. There's nothing that's asking for it. So, uh, again, I really like them. I'm doing what I can to implement um, cloud audit here at RightScale because I think the visibility is good. And you know, for those of us that are on that kind of bleeding edge and have the ability to push something and just do the right thing, I'd encourage you to do that as well. Excellent. So um, getting into some more technical depth again, um, somebody wanted to know, how do you manage the problem of, of steel CPU in the cloud? And I'll quickly define that. That just means um, you know, microprocessor cycles that were burned by the hypervisor or by another tenant. Uh, and, and we're not available to your virtual machine. So uh, the the, uh, the audience member wonders if there's a if there's a way to avoid CPU steal. Um, and you know, in the case of something like a DDoS, this becomes a security issue. So, what's your security response to it? Yeah. So from the standpoint of CPU, it all gets down to the cloud provider and their SLA. I know each cloud provider that I know of, you have the ability to specify you know an instance size and instance type that would give you complete access to the physical hardware underneath, that you're not multi-tenant. Really, you're single tenant the way it works. So if you've got a, you know, if you've determined that your requirement is that you can't have somebody snagging your CPU, then you should be using those type of instances. As far as bandwidth goes, like for distributed denial of service, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. There's no way to prevent a distributed denial of service you know, either if you've got a program that is vulnerable to a memory leak and somebody figures it out, then they'll make your program leak memory. And the only advantage or distributed denial of service protection is that a lot of these cloud providers have pretty big pipes. And in order to fill those pipes up, um, you know, it's, it's almost impractical. Uh, to do a network distributed denial of service against an instance on or you know, a set of instances, let's say a load balanced cluster, something like that, in say Amazon, I'm not sure it's actually practically feasible at the network level. I don't think you can pump enough junk down the pipe to fill their pipes up. So. <laughs> um, you know, I would add my own uh, take on this, which is that, um, as Phil said, if you have the money, you can make this a non-issue, right? And, and if you're in EC2, you buy a certain size of instance, you're guaranteed to be the sole tenant on that instance. But that still doesn't stop your bill from running up when somebody is DDoSing you. And, and this is a great example of where I, as a software and systems architect, can make a difference in the bottom line. Let's say I architect my application so that I account for failure of my individual tasks or work units or, or operations, right? If a certain operation is too long or gets stuck, I might have a scheduling system in place that sees that and redispatches that operation to another node. Um, one of the beautiful things about cloud is that you can go uh, small and cheap and numerous as opposed to large and big and centralized. So um, you can address the security threat, you can address the cost issue um, just by architecting your app the right way, by building 
um, failure tolerance into your app. Uh, we are at about five minutes past the hour now, and I know we all have commitments we have throughout the workday, so uh, I thought I would take this, this opportunity to, to wrap up our Q&A. Uh, looks like we've more or less got all of the questions out of the queue. Uh, there were a few questions we didn't have time to get around to. Somebody had wondered um, how they can measure the monitoring process in the cloud. What are, what are the metrics for your metrics like? Somebody else had wondered about right scale strategy. Are we looking at venturing into the cloud brokerage market? Um, so we didn't really get time to talk about these, these larger issues, but I encourage you to reach out to sales at rightscale.com if you want to engage in a dialogue about either of these topics. Cool. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, Phil, and thanks, everyone, for your time today. The webinar has been recorded. We'll be posting that on our website tomorrow morning, and we'll send you an email when that's ready to view. You can see on the slide there's a couple next steps in case you're interested in moving forward. I would like to point out RightScale Compute. It's our next big RightScale community event, April 25th through 26th in San Francisco. Check out our site, rightscalecompute.com. Um, and if you're interested in attending, this is a great opportunity to not only meet um, members far and wide across the RightScale team, but also Phil and Tony specifically, um, and to be able to have the opportunity to attend breakout sessions and get training and to meet with um, RightScale customers and learn stories. So check that out. And again, thank you so much for your time today, and have a great rest of your week. Bye.